Hey guys, so if you're new here or if you're not, if you want to hear me voice act, head over to our main channel, links down below. And if you don't, this channel's solely for TTS. Um, if you want to know all the details about what's going on, we have a stream up that you can go and watch, but let's just get into the video. So this is another story from the Paladin DM that also goes by Lord Althory. If you like his work you should check out his subscribe star to support him directly or check out his YouTube channel linked down below. And with that out of the way let's get into the story. Paladins, Order Undivided Chapter 59, Earl King and Bull Prince. Be me, Paladin, creator of NPCs that I never expected the players to decide to fight. Be Peregrine the relatively pacifistic, Andre the pragmatic, Yor the militant. Julian the Conqueror, Senkit the Crusader, and Kazdor the Wrathful. Kazdor sits astride his mighty warpig, the great beast snorting and pawing the ground as it prepares to charge. Opposite him, the Earl King sits, framed in the moonlight like an ancient pagan god atop his mighty displacer beast. In his hand is a long boar spear, more akin to a pike than anything else. The pale moon bears witness. The trees seem to shrink back to form an unobstructed list for the two nobles to joust upon. The air is still. Behind Kazdor, the rest of Order Undivided watches with varying degrees of frustration and concern. Behind the Earl King, the shadows of Lycans, Displacer Beasts, Shadow Mastiffs, and other predatory creatures loom, waiting for their signal to strike. The two warriors tense, as though waiting for the shot to be fired, or an announcer to declare the match. No mortal speaks, so the heavens do instead, for above them, a star falls into the western sea. It burns out in a brief brilliant streak, one that the combatants take a signal enough, and judge. It's battle music time. The Earl King's mount is swifter, springing forth on coiled muscle and sinew, pouncing into a lithe sprint. War Pig is slower to move, but more certain in moving. The night air is filled with dust as the boar's hooves throw it up and move the mountainous mount forwards with dread inertia. The pair thunder and silently rush towards one another, each rider readying themselves. The Earl King's spear gives him the greater reach, and his careful aim slips by Kazdor's defenses, laying open the dragonborn's cheekbones beneath his left eye. In the same spot where a pink scar yet remains from his battle with Avernius. It cuts through the weakened scales to the bone and nearly makes Kaz lose his vision and balance. Kazdor snarls through the pain and prepares to retaliate as War Pig draws him ever closer to the foe. It is not to be though, for the Earl King's agile mount springs away to the side before his axes can meet the Fairy Lord. Again, the spear comes in, this time the Earl King uses the wide blade at the end to cut at Kazdor. The Dragonborn raises his axes and blocks it but the force jars his entire body and makes his teeth shake. A prancing dancer this is not. The two reform, the Earl King's mount practically dancing back into her position, while War Pig turns sluggishly, kicking up yet more dust. The first exchange has not gone well for Kazdor, and the shadows behind him growl as his blood falls from his face onto the hungry forest floor. Don't even think about it, Andre says, glaring at Julian. I'm more than willing to stab someone in the back, but only if I'm certain I can kill them with it," Julian says. And considering vengeful spirit is steel, not iron, I'm not confident I could kill him with a single hit, even assuming I can hit him. A wise decision. The Earl King responds. And a good philosophy, ask alone. Why do I get the feeling that more people are poking into our futures than really should? It's rude to spoil the story before it's even written you know. Peregrine rebukes him. The Earl King laughs it off. Opposite them, Kazdor prepares to charge again. We need to get him off the beast. If we can keep up with him on the ground, we can at least stand a chance. He confers with Sivrid. Be ready. We're going to need some leverage to pull it off. I take it you have a plan? A basic principle of construction is that with a long enough lever and a strong enough fulcrum, you can move just about anything. Fortunately, we just got hit in the face by quite a nicely sized lever. Yeah. It's knee but a scratchy great pansy. Cause Dorozzi's war pig charges forwards again. The Earl King rides forwards, spear leveled. They meet again in a clash of steel and dust, their weapons ringing out in the night. Kaz manages to trap the spear's cross guard between his axes, but the hold is wrong. 
The Earl King places his other hand further up the spear and pushes. Blood and the silver axe go flying in the night. Kuz rides away, bereft of one of his axes and with a painful cut on the inside of his elbow. The spear's blade had cut just between the gaps in his armor, a perfect strike to a weak point. Fortunately, it was shallow enough that it had not severed the ligaments or tendons, and he can still use his arm. Not quite enough, but I have your motions now, and a better grip. He mutters softly in Dwarvish, because it might be better to retreat while you're still fresh. Yort advises. Nee laddie, he's brought a grudge against me, and against me father and king. Ah can I allow that to go unanswered? Ah, allow to go unanswered against me long beards, and against me brother, for they were my betters and the clan needed them. As for this Skinner though, I've nee allegiance and nee need for him, so I'll nee let it go unanswered. He charges forwards again, visibly steaming with fury. The Earl King rides forwards once more, thinking the enraged dragon born to be easy and predictable prey. His spear answers forwards for the kill, Ankus deflects it with his axe, then seizes it with his newly freed hand. The Earl King's eyes go wide as the immense bulk of war peak barrels on, the great mass of the creature forcing the fairy lord's spear away and him off balance. Taking the opportunity, Kazdor leaps from War Pig's back, hooking his axe around the haft of the spear, and unleashing his wings. With a mighty pull, Sivrid pulls Kazdor back, and the spear slams into the Earl King's gut. Already off balance, the fairy loses his grip on his seat, dismounted by his own weapon. He lands hard, flat on his back, while Kazdor sets down on his feet with spear still in hand. The Earl King rolls to his feet arms coming up in a defensive position to ward off an oncoming attack, but no blow comes. Instead, Kazdor walks over to his fallen axe, then tosses the king his spear. The Earl King catches it out of the air, looking at Kaz curiously. I fight fair. It's the only honest and proper way to fight. Kaz responds as he picks up his axe. I don't. The Lord of the Wild Hunt answers him, as the great displacer beast sheds its cloaking field and pounces at the dragonborn's exposed back. Ah Ken. Kaz retorts with a grin, as War Pig charges forth and hits the displacer beast in the belly mid-pounds. The mighty boar charges forwards and slams the panther into a tree with enough force to topple it, then gores the monster again with a triumphant bellow. That's what he's for. The Earl King laughs once more taking his spear into a proper stance as Kaz door charges in once more. The fairy tries to intercept with his spear, but Kaz knocks it away, striking thrice. The first blow falls short as the agile hunter slips back, but then he reverses it, striking the Earl King across the wrist, and leaving him open for the third to catch him on the shoulder. The keen dwarven axe punches through the fairy armor with contemptuous ease, and the Earl King's blood flows onto the forest floor. The wounded fairy back pedals, swiping the butt of the spear up and hitting Kaz door back. He strikes with a thrust that Kaz deflects upwards, then he brings it down, hitting the dragon born in the collarbone with the side of the blade. In spite of the pain, Kaz door laughs. What is so amusing? Ye bleed red, same as anyone else. Kaz responds with a grin, before forcing the spear back up and moving into range again. The Earl King lowers his spear and blocks the attack, spear locking against axe. The two men strain against one another for a long moment, before Kaz manages to force the spear to the side and get a clean swipe at the fairy's throat with his other axe. He hits Black Mist as the Earl King vanishes into a storm of raven feathers and reappears behind him. Kaz door whirls to block as the Earl King leaps back and swipes forth to keep the dragon born back. As he lands, the fairy sweeps up his cloak and vanishes into the night. Kaz watches carefully for the attack he knows is coming, but when it comes, he is unprepared. The Earl King hurtles out of the shadows with blinding speed, moving even faster than the displacer beast at a full sprint. Kaz door tries to block, but the thrust goes straight through, slipping between the plates of his armor and piercing through the chainmail behind like paper. Kaz door coughs up blood as the massive boar spear goes through his right lung and out his back. The fairy isn't done though as he rips the spear out and leaps in the air, swinging it in a great arc like a whirlwind, smashing through Kaz Dor's posture and leaving a massive gash across his upper arms and chest as it throws him to the ground. The Earl King goes to finish him off, bringing the long-bladed spear down like an axe. 
Kaz's door blocks it. Rasping for breath, flat on his back in the dirt, he blocks it. He breathes heavily for a few long moments, and then he gets a foot under him. He forces his body up into a sitting position, and then pushes himself back up to standing with his wings still blocking the attack. His normally clear blue eyes are so filled with blood that they have turned purple. The plants around his boots are blackened, the stench of charcoal fills the air. The blood wrath is upon him. Ye wanted Moroth, here it is. He roars, and dips to the side. He sways like a drunkard, coming around a whirling berserker slash that smashes aside the Earl King's defenses. His other axe bites into the fairy's gut, then again into his chest. Each attack echoes the fury of a volcano god at his forge. The Earl King staggers back and sweeps low. Kaz Dors takes flight and soars over it, then lands as a thrust comes in. Rather than trying to block it, Kaz Dor steps into the attack, sweeping his leg up and stepping on the half to the spear. He leans in close enough to kiss the fairy lord, then blasts him point blank with a torrent of dragon fire. The Earl King staggers back, burning and blinded, but Kaz doesn't let up. He hits him again in the stomach, again in the chest and then knocks the helmet off of the Earl King's head with a third blow that sends the fairy sprawling. Sensing weakness from his stunned opponent, and blinded by wrath, Kazdor leaps at him, axes raised to finish it. The Earl King drops his feigned stun, and raises his spear with a grin. Kazdor hits the spear and stops dead. It was the half end, not the blade, but even still it crumples his breastplate and shatters his sternum. If it had been the blade, Castor would have impaled himself, the mighty dragonborn falls to the side, unable to breathe properly. The Earl King rises, Helm lost, he looks like the shadow of an elven man given a third dimension. He looks down at the dragonborn, then tosses down his spear. I yield. Kaz raises a hand to his chest and pours in enough healing magic to take a breath so he can speak. I accept your surrender. He rasps out. Across the way, Warpig stops mauling the displacer beast, which limps back over to her master slowly. The Earl King places a hand on her forehead and the monster vanishes in a whirl of pine needles. I was right to call you Boar, son of Duthu. Like a boar, you hurl yourself forwards, too blinded by wrath to see the danger before you, and yet fearsome enough that nothing can be certain. He turns and strips a patch from his cloak, and then tosses it towards Kazdor. As it falls, it expands outwards into a banner showing a red boar on a black field. Take this as a gift, in memory of our battle. Kazdor has enough good sense to examine it suspiciously before accepting. Aye. It was an honor to face ye, and a delight to fight the fairy who kenned what they were doing. The iron shadows are found in a hidden monastery two days north and one day east from here. In a monastery set into the northern side of a valley filled with birch trees above the clear running rapids. The Earl King explains, pointing towards the northeast. If you wish to join the hunt, call, and I shall answer. Cause Dor staggers to his feet. Maybe, but why would I join ye when I know I can beat ye? He asks, joking mostly. The Earl King laughs one last time as he turns to go. A fair point, cause Dor Glamdring, a fair point. He says, and his laugh fades along with his shadowy hunt, and they are gone from this plane once again. The others approach. Well, it's a good thing you won his respect. Julian says with a bit of a sigh of relief. Still, a damned impressive fight. I know. I'm starting to wonder if you held back during our match. Senkit says with a slight grin. With Atar in the audience? When Shamat gives to charity. He'd never let me live that one down. Kaz retorts as he wipes some more blood from his face. Senkit reaches up and lays a hand on his face to heal it, her fingers lingering on the scar Avernius left. Eort coughs before it can become awkward. So, we have our enemy, and we have a name for them. Iron Shadows. Can't say I've heard of that before. You wouldn't have. The Hobgoblins are much more secretive about the existence of their Inquisition than my people. Andre answers him. Inquisition? Why would they be after us, and how do you know about the Hobgoblin Inquisition? Julian asks. I studied my people's enemies in great detail during my training, all of them, not just the drow. Alright that explains the second half, 
but once again, why are the Conqueror's Inquisitors after us? I'm aware I'm not exactly the most devoted servant, but I'm quite literally a paladin wielding his divine lightning on a semi-daily basis, I think I'd know if I pissed him off. Eort says. Again confused. And that still doesn't cover why they're spending that much platinum on setting us up for an indirect assassination when their own people are in bondage. Something strange is going on here. Julian ponders. Perhaps his most holy orders aren't quite as holy as they're supposed to be. Wouldn't be the first time. Andre says, speaking from experience. Regardless, we need to deal with this. We have their location, let's head there and deal with them. Sen says. After we rest and let us recover. Ah, I'm fine lass. You've been impaled, you're barely breathing, and I'm half of what's keeping you standing. You are not fine. We can afford to wait. Peregrine states. We were planning on stopping for the night anyways, this new information doesn't change that. Fine, fine. Cuz says to Redley and he sits down. We'll deal with the bloody monks in the morning. Be me, Paladin, creator and destroyer of societies. Because Dor Glamdring, Julian Tarahan, Andre Silverthorn, Senkit Zaratustra, Peregrine Horse Rider, and the Oort Son of Oort, Paladins of Order Undivided. The party rests over the remainder of the night to allow Gazdor to recover from his duel with the Earl King. But not before he stores away the banner the Fae Lord gifted him in memory of their contest. They rise slightly late, and the sun is beginning to rise with them, casting shadows over the land. Not wishing to be caught out by the teleporting monks of the Iron Shadows, they eat a somewhat unusual breakfast on the move, consisting primarily of conjured bread and dried fruit. They ride north and east, following the Earl King's guidance to the hidden monastery of their unarmed foes. About midday, they summit yet another rise and come out onto a beautiful vista. The summer lands are hilly, with forested hills divided by vales with rivers running down them. This vale in particular is stunning though. The river is wide, her waters swift and clear. The valley broad and covered in a forest of white birch trees. This is indeed the place. Andre, what do your elf eyes see? Asks Julian, and she scans the northwestern slope of the vale. The thin birch grow unusually large canopies for their slenderness, and thus the view from above is somewhat obscured. However, she does see something unusual. A set of solid white running in a line, like a whitewashed castle wall. There, at about 11 o'clock, halfway up the slope. There's definitely something unnatural there, but I can't make out what exactly. She reports. That's the right area, assuming the Earl King's information was accurate. I say we check it out. Peregrine suggests. Agreed, though be careful. There's most certainly something unusual going on here. Andre says cautiously. What do you mean? Kaz asks. Have we found any birch trees in these lands before now? And then suddenly to find a single area absolutely overflowing with them? Something about this place just seems... Artificial. Transplants maybe. Julian suggests. It could have started out as something small and then spread. Maybe, but even still, the amount of work it would take to cultivate a forest this size. Even by elven standards this would take a substantial amount of time and effort. For anyone else, this would be a multi-generational project. Monks are strange, maybe they're the ones behind it? I've met more than a few with a really intense passion for gardening, so maybe this order just likes birch trees. Peregrine suggests. My people cut down forests, we don't plant them. We'll set up farms for logging to make sure we don't run out, but this is too random for that. Creating an entire forest would be a massive vanity project. Eort says, still suspicious. Well let's not miss the murder monks for the trees and get moving. Peregrine says. Whatever the story behind this place is, I'm sure we can figure it out. The party gets moving, on foot this time, slower but harder to spot. The birch might provide good cover from above, but on ground level the thin trunks make it very easy to see anyone coming from almost any angle. Still, despite feeling so exposed, the paladins make it to the river unopposed. When they reach the river, Andre checks both ways, then points to a bridge further downstream. Julian shakes his head no, too likely to be monitored or guarded. 
they decide to cross where they are. Kaz wades across, carrying Senkit on his shoulders. Julian flies over, carrying Yort. Andri ties a rope to one of her arrows and fires it across, and then she and Peregrine climb using that. At least we didn't need another bloody raft. Kaz says quietly, shaking himself clean. Okay, how was I supposed to know there were going to be waterfalls? Peregrine asks. Fair enough, but still, ye could have warned us. Quiet. The woods may have ears. Julian advises, and the two cut off their reminiscing. The move forwards again, careful to be as quiet as a bunch of heavily armored knights can be. The air is tense, and the woods are too quiet. After far too long in a far too tense journey, the paladins come up the side of the vale and take cover behind the large rock as Andri peers ahead. There is indeed a large warded white stone, with a fortified gate and hobgoblins patrolling the walls. We're in the right place. Small problem, we need to get in. She confirms. Let's check the sides. There might be a weak point. Senkip suggests, and the party checks around the sides. Unfortunately for them, the front gate appears to be the only entrance. As they start to head back in that direction, Peregrine shivers as his bare feet step in a small flow of water. Be a ra. Snow melt, always a bit unpleasant. He grumbles. Julian stops, then grins. Water, they've got to be getting into water somehow. Follow that flow. He orders, and the party moves up the mountain. They soon find the source, a small stream flowing out from a pound fed by the snow from above, and perhaps an underground source. Julian sticks his head under the water to check his theory, and then comes up with a grin. As I suspected, there's a grate down there. It's an underground, underwater passage. In other words, I'll tick it in. Small problem with your plan there Kingfisher, Senkit comments. None of us are fish, and I highly doubt your book is a spell to give us gills. It doesn't. But it might not need to. Julian responds taking off his armor before grabbing a stick then diving into the pool. The rest of the party looks on as the apparently deranged Arsima pulls out the stick and sticks it through the bars of the grate, before swimming back up to the surface. What exactly was the point of that? Peregrine asks curiously. Simple really, a tracking mechanism. Julian responds, before activating locate object to track the stick's position. How far off would you say that fortress is? He asks nonchalantly. Probably about five or six hundred meters, why? Andri responds. How long can you hold your breath? He asks again, focused on the stick. About two minutes. You're not thinking. Oh, I definitely am. Well, the current got to stick there in about a minute forty, so if we swim for it we should be fine. You're insane. Senkit says frankly. So is charging the front gate. Julian counters. Senkit sighs and starts unbuckling her armor. You're going in front then. After stowing their armor in their bags of holding, Senkas jump into the pool. Working together, they manage to pry off the grate and open the way forwards before surfacing. Yort, you lead the way under invisibility, take Bast with you. Julian orders, the cat hopping from his shoulder to Yort's. She can communicate telepathically with me, so if there's anyone in the system I'll know. We'll need a few minutes to get our armor back on, so bar the door if you can. Got it. Eort responds. What about Bast though, I mean she is a cat. No, I'm not. Nor do I require oxygen. Bast responds, freaking the hobgoblin out slightly. I simply take this form for tradition's sake, now let's move. Eort takes a deep breath vanishes, and a ripple expands outwards from the surface of the pool as he dives in. Shortly thereafter, the rest of the party follow. Julian leads the way, conjuring a light around himself to guide the others after him. They follow him down the dark, twisting tunnels, Andre staying very, very close to others at all times. Eort and Bust swim ahead, moving with the current. The hobgoblin's eyes burn from keeping them open underwater for so long, his lungs start to feel like they're on fire. Then he sees it, a light above, a surface. He swims upward and comes up gasping. The poor hobgoblin drawing water from the cistern sees a sudden explosion from the well, and hears the sound of gasping, but sees nobody. 
The terrified acolyte turns to run for the door. Eort tries to haul himself out of the pool after him, but Bast is swifter. Leaping from the pool, the devil sheds her invisibility in her disguise. Eort sees her true form, a humanoid tigress, not unlike a tabaxi, but with abnormally long hair and a barbed tail. The Hamachula seizes the hobgoblin by the back of the neck, claws digging into him. She drags him into an embrace, her fur standing on end and forming into dozens of barbed spines that impale him. He opens his mouth to scream, but her tail stabs through his heart, and it becomes nothing more than a death rattle. Bast lays him to the side and shuts the door. She turns to Yort and raises a finger to her lips in a gesture, before reverting back to just a remarkably grumpy looking tabby cat. Julian pulls himself out of the water shortly after and pets Bast. Yort stares at him with a certain degree of wide-eyed horror. What? I told you she wasn't a cat. Julian responds calmly. Yort decides to avoid mentioning exactly how the acolyte died as the more heavily armored paladins get their armor back on. Despite being invisible, the dripping is still rather noticeable, so he just decides to drop it. He and Julian share a look that says they want to make a dirty joke at Sen's expense, but they also want to live to see tomorrow. Right, so we're in. What next? Peregrine asks. Find their leader, cut off the head of the serpent. Without command and control we can move through the area and just pick them off one by one. Or alternatively we find a jokey point and just let them grind themselves into paste on us like with the last few fortresses we've been in. Senk it jokes. True, but that's not exactly the easiest way we've dealt with overwhelming odds, and I'd like to keep my chest intact for once. Peregrine mentions, making light of his previous injuries. Agreed. We don't have any other resurrection scrolls just lying around. We need to be even more careful. Andri confirms. Right then. Time for something a bit more subtle. Considering their dripping and footprints would leave an invisibility spell fairly useless, the party decides to move as one. They poke their heads out of the cistern into the bottom level of the fortress. They move quietly, or checking corners, Andri watching their back. On at least two occasions they duck into a side cupboard as another acolyte approaches, a rather uncomfortable position needless to say. However, it pays off, as they make it to a staircase undetected. Traveling up it, they're surprised to find it only goes up one floor. Poking their heads out, they find the upper floor is entirely different to the basement. Where the basement was rough hewn stone bricks, the main floor is magnificent marble, with purple rugs and mahogany furniture. What in the nine hells? Is this a monastery or a palace? Peregrine remarks at the unexpected luxury. Maybe both? We'll figure it out after we paint its walls in blood. Andri remarks. I know we're planning on killing more or less everyone in here but did we really need to go to painting the walls in blood? Peregrine asks. I, this is marble, need need to ruin a good building. And purple rugs are bloody expensive. We have slightly bigger concerns than bloodstains to deal with. Eort comments. And I doubt they'll be half as concerned. The party continues its stealth until they find themselves in a spacious room with walls lined with books. Kaz door bars the door as the rest of the party looks around. A library. Expensive furniture. Marble columns and walls. What the hells is this place? Senkit asks. It looks to me like an imperial palace, at least according to the stories I heard growing up. Your notes. Impossible, the last hobgoblin empires were wiped out five centuries ago. Andri comments, maybe the empires were, but clearly not all their architecture. This far north, in an isolated and hidden position? It's not impossible that we might have found the remnants of one. Peregrine comments, it makes sense. I had always wondered what had happened to San Jonas's palace. I had assumed it was destroyed when the humans took it off us all those years ago, but we never even found ruins. Eort comments, if it wasn't actually in the capital, that would explain it. So, what, we've found an emperor we need to kill? Senkit comments. I guess we can add regicide to our list of accomplishments. I doubt it, the imperial line was wiped out. Eort comments. Maybe not. Julian says, poring over a book. 
This appears to be some form of registry of bloodlines, though I can't actually read Goblin. Give up here and get that comprehension spell of yours going. I want to know what's going on here. Yort says, taking the book. No, this isn't an Imperial bloodline registry, it looks more like logs from a census. Nobody in here has Imperial titles. If anything, these are just ordinary citizens. So, we found the census books. Not exactly the most groundbreaking thing to have a library for. Peregrine comments. I was expecting something a bit more exciting. I'm not even sure this is a census though. Yort says, his brow furrowed as he reads further. It's got references to other files, and then a bunch of abbreviations. STR, DEX, CON, I'm afraid this is meaningless to me. Check the reference then. Cause Dor suggests, looking strangely at Julian who is busy swallowing a live minnow. It's magic, it's weird okay. The R Sim remarks before choking down the fish. What's the reference Yort? Yort tells him and the R Simmer walks over to select the book. He pulls it down and turns to the page. Testing scores, height and weight, physical characteristics, marriage and children, notable attributes. He mutters, still confused, and then he turns to the other pages. More and more sheets, the entire book is filled with these strange reports on Hobgoblin's physical and mental abilities. What in the nine hells? He mutters. What in the world would they need all of this data for? Andre ponders. I can understand having a census, but this doesn't make any sense. Aye, it's more like they're cataloging cattle rather than folk. Cause Dor mentions, and Julian goes very pale. Yort, the register has a list of children and their spouse, correct? He asks quietly. Yeah, what's up? Yort asks. Julian walks the walls, observing the titles of the books, the dates and population segments monitored. He takes a succession of books, each around 20 years apart, and lays them out on her desk. He flicks through them feverishly, cross-referencing between them, seemingly oblivious to the outside world. Similar traits replicating, directed marriages between significant traits, generalized amplification of certain expressions. He mutters. Midges. Check the midges. He says before sprinting back across the room and seizing the most recent books within the magic users section. Even these relatively recent works are almost 400 years old. Yort, see if you can find anything more up to date, that's where we'll find the Imperial line. Go, he commands. His face is extremely concerned, as though he suspects that there is something terribly wrong and he really hopes he's wrong. So. Are you going to tell us what's up with this besides just being weird or are you going to keep waiting for us to stand in awe of how much smarter you are? Senkic says, unamused, you know what you said about cattle right? You know how you breed livestock? Julian explains. You keep a small population of the best and fittest males and females and have them breed more. Peregrine says. Wait, you're not saying that they tried to do that with people? Not exactly that, but yes. Though, as I suspected, they did do more or less exactly that with their magic users. They must have wanted to inflate the numbers they had. Julian remarks, looking over the walls of text. Most of the time though, it was just directed marriages, controlled bloodlines to breed a better hobgoblin. By the gods. Sank it curses. That's insane. Not as insane as the population must have gone. Julian says with a bitter laugh. Mid-King Syndrome, the product of inbreeding, replicated across an entire population. It wouldn't have been all at once, except maybe with the midges, but with as much data, as many years as this must have gone on. It was a society-wide eugenics program, and it blew up in their faces. Even with a substantial influx of outside blood, it would take generations to undo the damage done. Generations when they'd be weak, easy prey for outside attackers. The last logs here are from just before humans took San Jonas, that seems about right. Julian says, holding his face in his gauntlet, electricity dancing over his skin between the fingers. Well, those weren't the last of the records. Yort says, approaching with one, far newer looking tome. I found the most recent ones on the Imperial line, and I think I know why they're after us. He sets down the book with a thud. 
They spend all their time and resources on a breeding program that destroyed our people and abandoned the rest of us to slavery. He says with a hiss. His presence makes every hair stand on end, not from fear, but from static. He practically slaps the book open. All in vain, thanks to us. Congrats, we actually did wipe out an imperial line. The last line in the pages lists the last heir of what had once been an imperial dynasty. Clunny, legate of the 13th legion. No tabletop RPG is complete without beautiful models on the table and the best place to get models is from us. If you check the link below we have everything you could need for your magical realm. Only the finest of big titty wafers here. But if you're not into models or don't play with models we got you covered with subclasses such as the Gachimashi Wizards, the Simp Warlock and the North FC Fighter. Also we have started selling 5th edition adventures with our first one featuring Belle Delphine, the succubus that has poisoned the town's well and turned the villagers into simps. If any of that stuff sounds fun to you go ahead and check the link below but let's get back to the video. Be me. Paladin, who sets up and brings down kings and governors alike. Be Prince Kazdor Glamdring, Abbess Senkit Zaratustra, Burgermaster Peregrine Horse Rider, Lady Inquisitor Andre Silverthorn, Warmaster Julian. And Legate Eort, who is currently having a minor psychotic break. Eort begins to giggle, laughing in sharp, quiet barking hours, sounding more like he's choking or weeping than amused. The bitter laughter grows, slowly but steadily, like a hyena's mocking call that echoes through the quiet library before he takes a seat to calm himself. He rests his head in a hand half clenched into a claw and his chuckles fade to a bitter grin. So that's why you were always such an insufferably arrogant tool, you well-bred bastard. You were the prize stallion fit for the purple. Well, at least I know I'm no heretic, because you were anything but holy. He tightens his grip, the gauntlet digging into his head and drawing blood. It shows you know, with this little cult that made you. They took this long to come after me, this long to get riled up because you died. You'd think they'd be a bit swifter to ask after their prized hog was slaughtered before they could breed it again, or maybe you and Scythia were more than friends, HM. The blood drips from his head onto the table, and the others start to approach him, cautiously. The air around him is thick with static, and heavy with the scent of ozone. No. They wouldn't have allowed that would they? They bred our people like prized cattle, the sons of the conqueror as though we were base chattel, to be chosen for traits and herded along. Vanity of vanities, to think that they could outdo the conqueror's workmanship in creating us. Yet even after their sins brought our nation to ruin, they persist. Perhaps the inbreeding has affected them as well to be so deluded. In any case, now is not the time for fuming. Now Roth shall ask them and they shall be judged by their answer. He says, rising to his feet and making ready his weapons, forgive my indolence, this revelation has somewhat overwhelmed me. He says, speaking very carefully and quietly, even as lightning dances across his eyes. Julian, was that book cursed by chance? Senkit whispers to Julian, who shakes his head. Nee lass. Kazdor answers her. This is nee a curse, it's rough and a more fearsome grudge than most any, the kind my folk feel in the presence of giants. He turns to Yort, you've got good control laddie. Keep it that way, and let's see it resolved, Andre nods in agreement. And a just quarrel it is. These monks have committed heresy against nature itself, they must be destroyed. In that we agree. Senkit says. This science dies today. I'm usually not an advocate for abolishing learning, but I have seen too many worlds consumed by the flames of eugenics. Julian answers. This is one branch of knowledge that needs to be pruned. Peregrine is the last to speak, and the most measured in his answer. I am loath to pronounce total destruction so casually, but this. He sighs. This is an evil that echoes down through the generations, a foulness that will pervert the most fundamental parts of any goodly society in which it takes root. If man is to be bred like a beast, those who are weaker or less fit can in turn be exterminated like beasts. In the name of all those yet to come, this facility and the knowledge within must be destroyed. Thank you, all of you. Eort says. What's the play then? Senkit asks. They've been generous enough to have gathered most of their books here. 
Yort says, and I imagine my brief giggle fit has probably drawn some attention anyways. So stealth is something of a moot point. He turns to Gazdor. Cause, I do believe it's time to make like Alexandria and burn these fuckers down. Julian visibly winces at the reference to that particular library and quietly shoves a few of the books into his bag of holding. Eugenics might be a terrible idea, but it might be a useful idea to sow in an enemy country to bring about similar genetic collapse and give him all the moral excuse he needs. A few moments later, as the monks assemble and prepare to breach the library and slaughter the trespassers, they are alarmed to see smoke begin to curl out from under the doors. Several rush forwards to throw them open and try to save the valuable books, but these are flung back as the doors are flung open. Theme of Order Undivided vs Hobgoblin Ninjas Framed against the blazing inferno stands a party of champions. A great dragonborn clad in plate, with two axes in his hands and a cloak of scales on his back. A devil's child clad in the holy cloth overlaying strong plate, fearsome and beautiful as the summer days are long. An angel with a crackling gauntlet and an unholy avenger in its grip. A halfling in dragon scale with the killer's gleam in his hazel eyes. An ancient elf, standing with the full strength of youth and the wisdom of the ages. And at their head, the last son of the 13th Legion, and the first son of a dawning republic. The lightning of the conqueror is about him, and the fury of the Gracchi is upon him. Here stands the new age coming to wipe away the old as surely as the roaring tides of the Bosporus sweep away forums and temples of sand. He raises aloft his blade to call to battle. Order on me. No survivors. The battle is joined with great fury. Andri is the swiftest to answer. Knowing her arrows will be useless against the strange techniques of the monks, she charges forth with saber in one hand and dagger in the other. With every blow, cutting moonlight echoes, and two fall before they have a chance to stand. Alongside her peregrine follows, Dragon's tooth blades alight. He slips between one foe's legs, cutting their knees out from under them, then leaps up in a will to cut down a third with a long cut across the throat. Each wound blazes and festers in seconds, coming to naught but rotting meat and withered bone. Eort plunges ahead into the thick of the enemy. His dagger and longsword move every bit as swiftly as the halflings, but in far more of a simple and brutal style. A lunge to the shoulder, a chop to the skull, a knife in the chest, these are his death dealers. The monks, surprised by the sudden aggression, rally. One punches out at the exposed Eort, who raises his shield seemingly from nowhere and catches the blow. Even still, the fist leaves a dent in the steel. He sidesteps a chop from his left and pushes the attacker forwards into a roundhouse kick from his right. The blow hits the unfortunate monk in the jaw and rips it from his skull, casting it onto the floor. Andre ducks a punch only to take a knee to the chest and stagger back, gasping for air. A second moves in with a high kick which she sways to avoid. He closes the distance and delivers an open palm strike which she blocks with a sword cross. The impact jars her, and astoundingly the hobgoblin's palm isn't even scratched by punching a blade. What he is a bit more than scratched by is the flaming devil sword that comes down like a guillotine as Julian enters the fray. The Arsimer turns his blade and bisects the monk at the waist, his momentum carrying through into a lunging stab at the next in line. This one however leaps atop the lunging blade and runs up it, bare feet somehow not scorched by the devilish flames. She runs across it and delivers a solid kick straight to Julian's face. There's a crunch and a spray of golden nature as she pushes the Asimert nose into his face and his face into his head. He staggers back and she brings an arm down in a chop at his neck. Instead, it hits a shield with the sound of a ringing gong as Senkit shoves Julian aside and takes the blow. She rocks back slightly from the force, then leans forwards to throw the monk off balance. The hobgoblin staggers, then falls as Senkit capitalizes crushing the initiate's chest, then her skull beneath the thorns of her morning star. She offers Julian a hand up and he takes it, healing magic pushing his face back into its plain but not squashed position. Unfortunately, his nose remains broken. It's honestly a bit of an improvement. Sen offers kindly. Makes you look less like some random bean counter. Meanwhile, Eort continues to face some rather serious problems due to the sheer number of monks attacking him. 
Fortunately, their group attack is disrupted by 700 pounds of angry dragonborn charging into them. Cause Dor strikes one with an underhand swipe, splitting open his chest in a squall of gore. One particularly bold, or stupid, monk leaps on Kaz from behind to try to choke him out. Kaz soars upwards and slams him into the ceiling, then drops, burying his axes into two more skulls as he lands. This is going well. He says cheerily to Yort as the two get back to back. A bit too well, these are just the grunts, not the leaders. Yort responds, taking a swing downwards at one hobgoblin. The monk catches the blade by the flat, so Yort forces it down and drives his dagger into the monk's wrist. The resulting howl of pain is cut short as Yort takes his newly freed sword and cuts the monk's head off. Got a plan to find the skinners? Kaz asks. Yep. Give me some room. Yort answers as he tackles another initiate. Andre heeds his words and hits the mob from that angle, slitting a throat with her dagger as she steps in and cuts the fingers from an oncoming chop. Then cutting out the monk's eyes with a backslash, Peregrine follows through in a whirl of death, carving rotting gashes across first one's wrists, then another's gut. Before finishing by driving his blade directly into one particularly unlucky initiate's groin. All three fall in rapidly expanding pools of blood. The others start to take pause and a few steps back at that horrific display, and Julian steps forwards, igniting his divine terror which hits the imitates like a tidal wave hits a sand castle. Flee. He commands them, and several answer, the rest simply stepping back quickly as the Arsimer advances. Yort gets his hand on the initiate's face. Where are your leaders? He demands to know. To the initiate's credit, he doesn't answer or soil himself in spite of both the enraged Yort and the terrifying Julian both being in close proximity. Yort activates a low-level divine smite and sears his hand print across the monk's face. Where are they? He demands in a growl that would make Christian Bale proud. Throne room, go down the hall to your right, take a left, first door on your left. The initiate whimpers, please do gag. His cry for mercy is cut off by Yort's dagger in his throat. Keep them busy. I'll make sure the leaders don't escape. Yort says, and then vanishes. Julian's terror aura dims as the party readies its formation once again and gets ready for the next rush. Once it fades altogether, the initiate come to their senses and charge, roaring battle cries in the name of their god. Meanwhile, Yort moves invisibly into the door the initiate specified checking first to make sure that this isn't a trap. No, it is what the initiate said it was, a throne room. He enters quietly, sticking to the shadows of the tall Corinthian marble pillars, treading softly on the purple and gold drug laid out on the floor. He comes before the high throne, lifted up on a dais, an ancient decadent thing of black velvet layered upon a gilded frame. Besides it, there sits a smaller, plainer chair in which sits the woman who attacked him in the newspaper offices. She is smaller and younger than you would expect the leader of an order of inquisitors to be, and her eyes are closed as though sleeping. Greetings traitor, I have been expecting you. She says without opening her eyes. Yort freezes, wondering how she can see him. Not see you, sense you. Your malevolent key is impossible to mistake, and your slimy. Slithering mind leaves a trail very much like the slug you so resemble. Yort loses the invisibility and stands before her. You're one to talk of treachery and vile deeds, Kingmaker. Yes, I imagine you have discovered our improvement programs. Improvement. Is destroying our nation within breeding and playing at trying to surpass the conqueror's design improvement. The weak perish, and the strong must prosper. Is this not the will of the conqueror? Even the weak serve their purpose, and strength is not something for you to try to dictate through science. Is that what your blasphemous alliance with the lesser races is? Them serving their purpose. If you still consider the other races lesser, you are truly blind. You stand in the last remnant of an empire the so-called lesser races destroyed 500 years ago, in the rubble of a civilization devoured by chaos, given over to the ravages of the orcs and demons. You stand by and do nothing as the fairies enslave our people, but waste your time in a breeding project in a vain hope of creating a new emperor. Foolish boy. Only an emperor can save our people and unite the legions once more. 
If you cared even the slightest for our kin rather than your petty vengeance, then you would understand it. I do care, steward, which is why I have come to bring an end to the Empire. We shall save ourselves, and we shall conquer once more, not wait and pray for our savior like children before wolves. You mean to save us by destroying us? You are truly insane. I mean to save us from the shackles of both the Fae, and of the past. The Empire is dead, what remains is naught but a lick draining our lives away for a dream. The Empire is not the Groby, we are. We are the sons and daughters of the greatest conqueror the cosmos have ever seen, and we shall unite together, and destroy both the powers of chaos, and the foolishness of old women who would shackle us to wraiths. We shall see how you shall accomplish this when you are a wraith yourself, blasphemer. Eort braces himself for an attack, but it does not come from the woman in the chair. Only the sheer combat instinct built up from his sparing sessions with Peregrine saves his life as he dives to the side. From above, another monk armed with a gallow glass falls from a hidden position on the ceiling, bringing their great blade down. As the ought came to his feet, another monk emerged from the shadow of a great pillar and struck him from behind leaving a gash in the back of his neck. Another leapt from behind a pillar, lunging forwards with fingertips pointed like spears. Eort raised his shield and blocked the strikes, and then his arm erupted in pain. The pressure points, struck through the shield, a triad of portals into the burning hells themselves, nearly dropping the young hobgoblin to his knees, before a fourth seized him by the back of his head and lifted him off his feet, before slamming his face into the floor. The stone cracked, and black blood filled the cracks. The steward rose and approached the fallen paladin malevolently. She raised a foot to finish him, only for her to pull it back with a shriek as a black and orange tabby cat scratched her soul and leapt away. A cat? She asked bewildered. More of a range finder in this case. Bass purred back. Before she can answer, she and her students turned at the sound of a cracking at the far wall. As they watched, cracks spread across the ancient marble, with brilliant light on the other side. The steward's eyes went wide and she dived for cover her somewhat slower students being less than lucky. A bolt of powerful lightning tore through the wall and the steward's miniature thrown, across the room, and across the acolytes, throwing them off yacht. Julian and the paladin stepped through, the proud Arsimer grinning ear to ear mischievously as he shook the static and smoke from his claw. Rule one yacht, don't split the party. Yacht gave him a grin back through a bloody face before vanishing again. The steward stood up brushing the suit from her robes. Kill them. She hissed. I'll deal with the traitor. You'll try. Eort answered her, flickering briefly back into being next to her and swinging. She moved to catch the blade, but her hands went right through the perfect illusion, and Eort's long sword went through her stomach, lighting crackling around the wound. But this is the end of your era. I have already foreseen it. His shield slammed into her back and flung her off his blade, smoldering from electric burns. She pulled herself to her feet and faced down the blade of the first son of a new legion, and a new empire. Come on then. Let's see who the conqueror truly favors. Eort's theme. The shadows crowned the last steward of the empire, and lightning was the laurel of the champion of the new order, both took a single step forwards and vanished. The paladins and the acolytes charged one another. Galloglass met vengeful spirit in a flare of sparks and cinders. The hobgoblin was stronger, but his mind was weaker, Julian gave ground, then lashed out with a boot into the younger fighter's groin. Stepping forwards, he shoved the blade up, knocking aside his guard and bringing the blade down, sending him flying back with a massive glowing scar from collarbone to thigh. The crane style slipped through Andre's guard, delivering three precise jabs to her shoulder, neck, and the underside of her jaw. The elf staggered back, then laughed, amateur. She snorted as she forced her hands to keep gripping the blades. Pressure points are far from the most painful thing you can do to a girl. She answered sickly sweet, then stepped forwards, blades glowing with magic. The monk slipped away with nary a scratch, but his vision went blurry, the light scratch burning as though his entire arm was on fire. What poison is this? He whimpered. Refined ghost chili extract. Andre answered him. It also makes an excellent curry. She moved forwards, 
cutting another narrow slash across the face, and a shallow cut on the chest. The chest doesn't burn nearly enough. The dagger's just death nettle. She explains as the insidious poison kills the nerve endings. The grappler sized Kazdor's arms and tried to throw the huge dragonborn in vain. Kaz, ever want to fight fair, dropped his axes, and seized the monk's forearms in both claws, lifting him off the ground and flying upwards, slamming him into the ceiling, then dropping him with a people's elbow into the floor. The hobgoblin vomited blood as Kaz's impact broke all of the ribs on his left side. The other shadow monk appeared under Peregrine, foot first. The uppercut launched the halfing into the air and she followed after, delivering another two blows to his chest and sending him flying into a pillar. No sooner had she touched down again before Senkit slammed her into a different pillar with her shield and proceeded to lay down a savage beating with the mace, leaving the monk to slump to the ground with most of her face missing. Eorton the steward vanished and reappeared in flashes of smoke and thunder, each time only for an instant. He forcing her back with a careful cut, her putting him on the defensive with a solid kick. They broke invisibility as they emerged in midair, Eort in a whirl, lighting flying off his blade to extend his strike. He hit her dead on, but the mystic bent the lighting around her and flung it back at him, sending him sprawling back, stunned. She rushed forwards with a low sweep which he jumped over, kicking her in the face to stagger her back. She parried away his sword with her bare hands, not even being scratched by the enchanted blade. She then seized his arms in her hands and yanked up, pulling him forwards into a kick, then dropping back to throw him over her head. Eort kept his senses though, and the moment his boots touched the floor, he activated their magic whirl on the spot and reversed the throw, sending her flying back into another pillar. She pulled herself to her feet and the two came on against one another once more, Eort flickering into four identical copies. She took a cut across the face, then another that removed one of her thumbs. She answered with a series of whirling kicks that blew the illusions away like autumn leaves. Placing one foot forwards each, he brought down a chop infused with lighting, and she caught it. Electricity danced around them as he struggled against divine power, neither able to match the other. Eor tried to disrupt the balance with his dagger, but she caught it and forced it away, sending it sliding across the marble floor. With her hand still bleeding from the knife, she grabbed him by the throat and began to squeeze the life out of him, manicured nails cutting into his flesh. You say all these things, all these promises of saving our people, but with what? You cannot even defeat me, by what shall you accomplish this? She asked him mockingly. In answer, he kicked up his shield into his empty hand and threw her off, the cut finally falling and scoring her across the body with electricity. By this I shall conquer. He answered, stepping forwards in a whirl, taking the blade in both hands, and calling on everything he had left. About him the lightning curled into the six-clawed talon of order undivided to strike her down. It struck true, mauling the monk and sending her flying across the throne room into the imperial throne, which exploded into splinters, the wood beneath the gold long rotted. The steward pushed herself up onto her knees, and tried to stand, but collapsed, looking up at the ort as he approached. She flicked her gaze to the others, but the paladins had finished with them already. She turned back to Eort, practically begging. If you kill me, there will never be another emperor. You will destroy every chance we have at reclaiming our former glory. Eort took her hand and pulled her up. When I kill you, I set us free to pursue new and greater glories. He answered coldly and hefted his knife. Six Emperor Tyrannis. Thus, he sentenced her and drove the blade into her throat. The long knife plunged deep and pierced the steward's heart. She gasped once, and breathed her last, falling dead before him. Eort retrieved his knife and limped down. Come on, the building won't last long with that fire. He told the paladins. And we have a nation to rebuild. Be me, paladin, ruler of dozens of worlds, none of which have developed fire currency yet. Because Dor the engineer, Peregrine the cook, Andri the apothecary, Julian the teacher, Senkit the abbess, and the Ort the architect, what order undivided might be better known for in times of peace. But, 
peace is not what they have in mind this day, riding northwards once more to the dominion of Countess Ashbury and her slave empire, the burning ruins of the iron shadows based behind them. Julian and Eort ride close by to one another, discussing potential strategies in low tones. They seem to both be in agreement that using guerrilla tactics to wear down the enemy and bottle them up is a good idea. But Julian keeps making references to some land called Vietnam that he ought has never heard of. Giles, I respect the breadth of knowledge living on Sigil gave you, but I don't understand about half of what you're saying. Please try to remember I have only ever been on this plane of existence in Herfi Wild, and I plan to keep it that way. Onwards they rode, until at around three hours past noon, they came upon it. Sprawling across two hills and the valley in between, a magnificent ruin of an elven city. Once proud spires of silver and living wood now were broken and perished. Streets of whitewashed stones were cracked and overgrown with weeds, the rope bridges between the trees were all but rotted away, and the smell of decay was heavy on it. Yet still, they could see a great black smoke hanging over the city, like from heavy industry. The wind blew, and brought the smell of coal and metal with it. Well, he didn't mention the wee fact that the cross sign near his lady's hall was in the middle of a bloody ruined city. Cause door cursed in surprise. Julian Fassi palmed, his helmet making a dull ringing sound as his gauntlet hit it. Of course. Silver mines. Fee Karen's primary exports were all silver, so this is what she's using all the slave labor for also explains how she was able to afford all those slaves. With the prices they go for you'd actually need a silver mine to afford one. Or a large plantation for growing something like tobacco, coffee, or cotton. Sen mentions offhand, drawing a slight stare from Julian. What? Child's a tropical climate, perfect for growing that sort of thing, of course we have plantations, never mind. Julian says, shaking his head. We at least know where the crossing is, right? Center of the valley, between the two hills. Cause said, and war pig got moving. Cause didn't spur him or otherwise compel said movement, for that would have been a remarkably dumb idea the boar simply got moving because it knew where to go. As the party rode down the long abandoned streets, Eort put his helmet on and he stood up to conceal his identity. Andri looked about at the ruined city and began to rub her elbows and neck uncomfortably. Senkit rode up alongside her, Elk and Diganod on setting aside their distaste for the other and behaving for once. Fine, I'm fine. Andri said nervously. Just. Altogether too similar to home. Senkit reached out a hand and laid it on the moon elf's shoulder. Andri flinched at the touch, and Sen withdrew it, looking slightly embarrassed. Sorry, was just trying. I know Sen, it's okay. I appreciate the thought. Just. Not used to any physical contact that isn't us trying to kill something or something trying to kill us. Hey, well that is the majority of our day now isn't it? Too true. I've been meaning to ask though, how you deal with it. What do you mean? I mean doing what you do. You're the one taking most of the hits in any fight we go in. I've put a dozen arrows in you, and you keep coming. Hell Sen. I've seen you get up with a broken back. How do you not go crazy from getting torn apart on a regular basis? Sen's face turned grim. I deserve it. She said plainly, and Andre's face turned confused. I'm a devil's child done, damned from the start. Every blow I take is penance for my blood, and every monster I kill is an atonement sacrifice for the sin of existing. I should have never been born un, so me getting hurt, even dying. It's just evil tearing into evil. Better me than someone who is worth something. Un looked at her friend with great sorrow. Sen, I've seen evil firsthand. I know what a real devil does and what a monster's soul looks like. You aren't one. Monsters aren't covered in scars. They're the one who cover their victims in them. You're trying to carry all the world's evil, even when you're some of the best we have in this crazy world. Senkit put on a false faint smile, and an illusory upturn of emotion. Thank you for that Andri, she said, though she did not believe a word of it. Still, better to soothe her friend's feelings than bring her down. Andri had seen enough false faces to know one when she saw one. Still, she put on a false face of her own in return. Any time Sen, she said, and that she meant, any time, and for as long as it took until that face wasn't false anymore. 
Wah, I think we found it. Kaz called out from up ahead, and the two raced to catch up. This crossing was not nearly as subtle as the one that they had found in the clearing near the abbey. This one was instead about as subtle as Kaz's door. A great stone archway, inlaid with face symbols, with a shimmering green portal spanning the gap between the two sides of the arch. No shit Sherlock. Julian commented dryly. Who's Sherlock? Gaz asked, slightly confused. Never mind, but yeah, that's definitely it. Then once more into the breach. Sen said with a sigh, and they rode downwards, and into the portal. On the other side, they found a very similar scene. In fact, it looked almost like the exact same city. If not for the very distinct feel of the Fi Wild, they wouldn't have known that they'd left their plane at all. Well this is interesting. They built the city on two planes, or maybe the city grew up around the planar crossing. Julian considered. Both actually? A familiar voice said, and the party turned to see Mittug standing there, arms crossed as though he had been waiting for them. He was clad in armor now, a fine suit of mitral chain, and he had a grand halberd on his back, one fit for a king. Andre studied the weapon closely, but it seemed to just be a magical halberd. Still, something about the weapon and the one carrying it made her skin crawl. I was wondering if you were going to show up after those doppelgangers showed up replacing you. Ah, yes, that. Julian said. What did you do with them? You knew. Oh, then you. Well this is a shade awkward. They are rather dead. Well, at least I only paid half their fee up front. Apologies for that, we hired them to throw our enemies off our trail while we dealt with them. It seems that we neglected to inform you of that. It's of little matter, and I understand your reasoning. They hardly put up a fight if we're being honest. How did you find out in the first place? I have. Experience dealing with shapeshifters. There's something of a common problem here. I see, well then, we've kept you and your lady waiting long enough. Shall we be going? The brawny elf nodded, and the party got moving once again, traveling back out of the city for some ways before coming upon a carefully maintained yet small path through the woods. Following it in single file, they soon came to a large man, surrounded by a high fence, nestled into the woods. The gates swung open automatically as they entered, and shut behind them when the last one had passed through. A page arrived to lead their mounts to their stables, but the paladin simply dismissed them. Bucephalus and Belisarius melted into pools of shadows, Arvi curled up to sleep and faded away, Bartholomew curling up next to the Ignodon and following after. Pan trotted out of sight and vanished, and Warpig simply poofed out of existence unceremoniously. Once they had entered, they found themselves in a spacious, airy foyer lit by sunbeams filtering in from many high windows. The glass had a slight green tint to it, giving the whole room a somewhat forested feel, or perhaps a more sickly one depending upon how one looked at it. From here, they were led up a flight of stairs into a sitting room, equally well lit by natural light, and also a roaring fire in the back. Sat in one chair was a very pale, very old elvish woman, with skin like ivory and hair grey as winter clouds. Her eyes were still sharp and bright though, without the cataracts of transcendence. She still appeared strong, but wrinkles were beginning to gather around her eyes and her proud face was drooping ever so slightly. Ah, the lords of the Ordanic Union, come all this way to see me. Forgive me if I do not rise in your presence, I am growing weaker in my old age. She said with the voice of a woman entering her late forties. Though Andre reasoned that she looked around 900 years old or so, give or take a few decades. Nee need, we are protectors, nee kings. Cuz said, with a pointed look at Julian. Julian shrugged it off. Call it is you will Prince Cuz door. Thank you for coming to offer your assistance. I am told that you suffered some unwelcome attentions on your travels here. I, a few leftovers of the hobgoblins we removed from the abbey. Ni macho a problem. Indeed, they aren't worth much in most cases. She says, then looks at the ort, still wearing his helm and cowl. Though I am told I stand in the presence of an exception to that rule. Eort did not answer, nor offer any response whatsoever. She nodded approvingly. I am indeed then. 
most have to be trained not to speak when in the presence of their betters, and I sense not even the beginnings of his bloodlust. It is a most impressive ability to conceal his presence. Peregrine spoke in his friend's defense, for aught would not. Yes, his abilities have made him a valued member of our order, in full standing. I would count him as one of the finest swordsmen I've had the honor of sparing with. Is that so? Lady Ashbury mused. Well, forgive my ramblings, I am certain you must all be weary from the road. My servants have prepared rooms for you all, and I have a baithouse out in back if you wish to wash the dust from your feet. Shall we assemble for a more proper conversation at dinner? I have solicited a halfling chef to ensure there is no fear for fairy food. I would appreciate that. The road grows harder to walk the longer you walk it, as I am sure you know. Peregrine responded with a tired smile. Lady Ashbury did not return it. Prince Kazdor, I have arranged for my servants to direct you and your companions in a tour of my operations tomorrow. Is there anything you will require to better analyze our effectiveness? Nee lady, I've brought all I need to get me job done. Kazdor responded, tapping his bags. It'll probably take a few days of work down there to get all the measurements and such done though. I shall be certain to supply you with whatever servants you require for this task, thank ye. Kuz responded, and the party dispersed into the baithouse. This one lacked separate facilities for men and women, and thus lots were cast to see who would bathe first. The girls won, and so Andri and Sen went in to clean themselves off. They were rather surprised when Bast also leapt into the hot spring and audibly sighed in relief. Andri, having none of Julian's shenanigans, and picked up the cat to put her out. Bast responded by scratching her and forcing her to drop them. What, do you expect me to clean myself off with my tongue? She hissed at the bleeding elf. You're a cat, so yes. Senkit responded flatly. I am as much a cat as you are a human, little sister. Bast responded arrogantly. Yes, yes you're actually some fiend or another Julian's mother kept around. He can also see though your eyes. Andre pointed out, please, if the boy wanted flesh, he'd have it. He's actually somewhat hopeless in that regard. I have never seen such complete disinterest in all my eons. Bast responded before walking over to a cleaning rag and draping it over her face. Satisfied. Senkit and Andre took one look at the ridiculous spectacle and burst out laughing. Later that evening, the paladins met once more with the Lady Ashbury and Mitlok for dinner. The meal was quite good, a roasted salmon served with a goat cheese ravioli, everything drizzled over with an excellent mustard sauce. A red wine was served with it, although white perhaps might have been more traditional. Nonetheless, the hints of plum and oak in the fermented grapes was excellent, even beer totalakas door found it quite good. Peregrine noted the halfling servers, which had similar marks to jokes tribe back south had. Red tattoos around the eyes and mouth running down towards the chin. He asked her about this. Oh yes, you must have encountered the ones about the abbey, I remember now. When the blight first struck the land, I took many halflings under my wing for their protection. They've lived near my lands for years now, and I believe this particular wine came from one of their vineyards. Well, that's quite interesting. I'd like to visit them, if they'd of me. I'll send a message their way. She responded, then turned towards Julian. Lord Julian, I reviewed your proposal for the trade routes, and I must ask what you need with all of that silver? My dear I am building a nation. Julian responded calmly. One of the things said nation will need is a unified currency. I plan on creating a mint and using that to regulate monetary policy within the union. This will greatly simplify trade and allow me to monitor the economy to make sure we don't all of the sudden go bankrupt. Intriguing, so you're importing my silver to make money, and paying for it with services and products. I see this being quite beneficial to both of us, particularly as your little empire develops. I know an excellent silversmith who may be of use to you. Put me in contact with him and I'll see how he measures up to my current candidates. Julian responded carefully. Of course, he would not be handing that kind of power to anyone he didn't directly control, but it didn't pay to be rude. It's rather fortunate that we encountered one another, wouldn't you agree? Lady Ashbury mused, 
Indeed. Though a question has occurred to me, Andre muttered as she ran a finger atop the rip of her glass. You fuel most of your mining with hobgoblin slaves, yes? Where are you getting the food for all of them? I largely import it from adjacent counties, why do you ask? Simply planning ahead, just in case we ever face a shortage. Wouldn't that cut into your profits though? A wise decision, and less than you'd think. Keeping them in a state of semi-starvation keeps the savages docile and too weak to try anything. You know how those animals are, and what must be done to control them, I am aware. It's fitting honestly, with as many people as they starved as they raped their way across the world, it seems only just that they eat the suffering they caused so many others. There is no justice in this world but that which we make. Andri responded in apparent agreement. Indeed, speaking of justice I heard that you acquired yourself a drow pet recently. Oh, that thing. Not exactly a pet, or much of anything anymore. Andri said, allowing her old cold cruelness to slip into her voice with a faint evil smirk. What did you do to him? The less said, the better for all our appetites. Andri replied coolly. Even Senkit and Peregrine began to worry about when the last time they had seen Zirit was, even though they knew Andri was lying. Mostly because she'd be seizing up with Blight about now if she wasn't. The dinner progressed without incident and with a good deal of meaningless small talk. Soon though the paladins retired for the night. As Senkit prepared to go to bed, she tensed up as she sensed another presence in the room. Whirling with a palmful of hellfire at the ready, she stopped when she saw Andri. Sorry Sen, I wasn't sure if you were asleep or not and didn't want to wake you if you were. Andri apologized in a swift whisper. Senkit sighed and dulled her flames. It's fine, what is it? Do you have a minute to talk? Sure. Sen said, and Andri took a seat next to her on the edge of the bed. I need you to promise me something Sen Andri said after a long moment. What is it? Don't ever let me go back to the way I was, the way I pretended to be tonight. You won't done. Promise me. Andri demanded. I promise, but what's brought this on? Senkit asked. This Ashbury woman, she terrifies me. Don't look at me that way, I don't think she's a physical threat, though she's far more capable than she appears. It's something else. She blurs the lines, the way she talked about holding slaves, starving them to keep them docile, how excited she was when I implied, I'd done something to Zirit. I can't look at her without seeing a drow wearing a moon elf skin. At the same time though, I can't look at her without it feeling like a mirror. Senkit was quiet for a moment as she thought. You're right. It is a mirror on your past, and it does bear more resemblance to a drow than it should. She said, and Andri flinched as though Senkit had punched her. But that was the past. Perhaps that was you, but no longer. You have determined that you will move past that and you are moving, but if I start moving back, I'll be there to stop you. So will Peregrine, Anchor's door, and everyone else, particularly Yort. But you won't. You can be better than you were, because that is what you are made to be. I believe in you. I'd be in a hell of a lot of trouble if I didn't believe in atonement, now wouldn't I? Senkit said with a sad smile, and she gently laid a hand on Andri's shoulder. Andri flinched but didn't pull away. Instead, Senkit pulled her close and wrapped her arms around her in a hug. You're my friend, I know you, and I know you're no monster. She told her. Monsters don't care after all. She said, echoing the words of advice Kazdor had given her those many long nights ago. Thank you. Andri said softly. Anytime, you're my friend after all. Of course, what are our friends for? Andri responded. Rural is a great app available on the Apple and Google Play Store as well as desktop for creating beautiful 8-bit character art. The app has 14 supported races, 150 plus weapons, 400 plus armor pieces for you to mix and match, 20 plus mini bases. There is that much to work from I was able to make Cold Steel the Hedgehog, the God Emperor of Mankind, Pepe and they are always adding more artwork. The app also has a character sheet to help keep track of everything during games. And if that wasn't enough you can play about with the app for free with limited artwork. So go ahead check it out and if you decide to buy the app use promo code NICKBEDIA for 10% off and it lets them know we sent you.
It's a great sponsor and a great app and we hope you guys go ahead and check it. But let's get back to the video. Be me, Paladin, lover of the word for the word first loved me. Because door son of Maradin, Senkit daughter of Zeril, Peregrine son of Avery, Andri daughter of Eristre, Julian the Bastard, and the Ort the Forsaken. A new day dawned, and the Paladins roused themselves from their slumber and set to work about their day. They dressed themselves and assembled once more in the dining hall for a breakfast of eggs, greens, and apples, simple fare on the fare on the face of it, but expertly prepared. As they finished their meal, the Lady Ashbury joined them. Her pale skin glowed softly in the early morning light. Apologies for my lateness, I appear to have slightly overslept. She said with a slight apologetic bow. She did not strike any of them as the sort of woman to sleep any less, or any more, than she so desired. Still, the paladins turned their cheek to the petty insult. No matter. Andre asserted calmly. It does not do to begin business on a poor night's rest. Indeed. As to that business, I have arranged for you to travel and observe the mines of course. Milk will accompany you to act as security. The slaves have been sufficiently dissolved, as it were, but still can be aggressive. We are quite capable of dealing with any trouble they could possibly give us ourselves. Senkit responded bluntly. It's not like we've killed several small armies worth of the bastards at this point or anything. Nonetheless, it never hurts to have an extra pair of hands, just in case. You never know what might happen, she said, with a sly look at the ort as if to imply he might turn traitor. A wise decision. There are no untrustworthy elements in the room. He responded in a perfectly polite and tactical tone. He might have well just slapped her. Eort was taking precise care to be even more groomed than usual, and his table manners were better than Kaz's. Andre raised an eyebrow. Normally the practical hobgoblin ate in whatever way was swiftest without choking or soiling his armor. He'd use a shovel if he could get away with it. The noble woman looked narrowly at the brith Koron she was forced to share the table with. No, I'm not translating that. The closest things to it in this language are illegal to say in several countries. The glare lasted for a full minute before Kazdor coughed, with the kind of cough that brings a bit of smoke. It was getting quite clear the Dragonborn was growing tired of playing at niceties. At any rate, it is some distance away and will take some time to tour, particularly if you need to make your evaluations. She said, finally breaking off the glare. I suggest you depart for there sooner rather than later. Gladly. Kaz replied. The party was kind enough to oblige him and finished quickly. Not many had an appetite. Within ten minutes, they had called back their mounts and rode quickly back towards the portal. They rode across and continued towards the base of one of the tall hills. Mhilk led the way, riding atop a giant lizard. It was clear enough when they arrived, the first notable sign being the large wall that had been constructed around something putting out a good deal of dust and smoke. They entered in by a large gate guarded by several Eladrine armed with halberds, passing under the watchful eyes of archers on the walls. Inside, they found what could best be described as a labor camp. Several of the buildings had been reconstructed to serve as barracks, there was a large open-air dining area, and a giant pit in the center of it. The entire area was completely empty. They're down in the pit, most of them anyways. Mitralk explained cheerily. He seemed in a good mood, and it was somewhat understandable. It was a brilliant sunny day outside. The birds were chirping, it was neither too warm nor too cold. A faint breeze blew in every once in a while. It was, providing you ignored the surrounding area, a perfect day. The night shift is resting though I imagine. Ye have a constant work cycle then? Ah see. Cos Dor says. Quite efficient, especially considering ye workforce is accustomed to the dark. Well, it's not like sunshine matters much underground. Mitralk explained casually. Though you may need to duck while we're down there I'm afraid. The tunnels were hardly built for someone of your stature. Need need to apologize. Ah, I'm quite used to it. Kaz responded. They approached the min shaft and Kaz door observed it with a severe as I. Large shaft style production, I, I. Makes a certain degree of sense, but old, quite old. 
This was the city's afford it warriors wasn't it laddie? The brawny elf nodded, cause door pointed to the other sides of the shaft. It expanded outwards as it came up towards the surface, like an inverted cone. Ye've cleared it out to prevent collapses as ye dig deeper. Sloppy. Ye'd be better served by installing a series of braces that go all the way down. This is just gonna become an exponentially larger problem the deeper ye dig, and judging by this ye've already dug plenty deep. The party began to walk down the slope, slipping slightly as they went. The slope was rather steep, and residue had built up on it, giving it a dry, sandy quality to it that gave under their feet. This is ni good either. Kaz muttered. Ye could use some rails to properly move or up this with any efficiency. They reached the center, where a large station had been set up with an elevator to lower things down into the mine and then drag them back out had been set up. The elevator itself appeared to be a platform suspended by a chain which ran back to a wheel, which several slaves were set to work turning. Now this is just a wee bit mad. Ka said with a frown. It's a waste of good manpower. Any bloke set up here is one you'd any have in the pit, and a duty like this is gonna need to be cycled frequently. It's just a major energy drain already. Ye'd be far better off setting up a pair of elevators operating on a tight schedule and a pulley system. One goes up, the other comes down. It's simple stuff really. The wheel generally serves more as a disciplinary tool than anything else, so ye can only get up and down if they're misbehaving. Seems fool to me. They are always troublemakers. Surely you understand this from dealing with your own pet beast. Speaking of which, where is he? Oh, Eort's waiting outside. Andre said calmly. He seems somewhat distressed by the place. Despite all the work you've done civilizing him I suppose he is still a goblin. Mithilk said with a sigh and a nudge of the head to a guard. One standing guard on the wall saw it and checked. Sure enough. Eort was sat outside the gates on a rock, whittling away at a block of wood. The hobgoblin turned and waved. Meanwhile, the actual Eort only kept from throwing Mittal down the minshaft by the reminder that he was only using invisibility and not his improved version. And thus would be revealed if he did so. He looked upon his kinsman turning the wheel as the party gathered on the elevator and began to descend. Their bodies were surprisingly strong. The hard labor had perhaps made them even more fit than his own brutal training regimen. Their eyes were dull, but not the eyes of beaten men and women, rather those of people too exhausted to think. Not the eyes of fighters either though. These people would not know to think of freedom if they were able. As they descended, Kazdor commented on the low number of guards down here. Are the dozen or so the only folk you've got on the elevator? Yes, this is the only way back out so we don't feel the need to police the tunnels themselves, they're too large to constantly monitor anyways. What about tunneling out? Oh we raid the tunnels every few weeks. We've caught quite a few over the years, ah, here they are, he said, and he lit a torch so Ka's door could see, for they were quite far underground by now. The bodies of hobgoblins, crucified to the sides of the minshaft, surrounded them. Dried blood still stained the rocks and the wooden planks they had been bound to. Bound, not nailed, so that they would live longer. All Ka's dog could bring himself to say in response to this abomination was, those are gonna get in the way or reinforce I in the shaft. He said it quietly. He ought nearly lost his grip, both on his temper and on his invisibility spell. He had heard of this practice, how it had been common in the ancient empire, but now he witnessed it fist and, a lump began to form in his throat. His rage had left the heat and descended into a cold fire fiercer than the pits of hell. His vision blurred. Then, they reached near the bottom of the shaft, and could see the whole expanse of the operation. Dozens of tunnels, each bustling with slaves carrying ore and rock and detritus moving here and there. Several turned to look at the descending elevator and whispers began to circulate. The lift landed. A Mithilk led an nauseated party off, the hobgoblin scrambled back and away from them. Their eyes were bright with fear. They were clad in rags that barely qualified as clothing, though they were not as malnourished as Eort had feared. They were certainly not eating well, but they were physically strong. Thus, as one younger hobgoblin, perhaps no more than her tenth year, stumbled as she backed away from Senkit and fell in her path.
It hurt him all the more to see the girl's mother drag her out of the way. The woman begged Senkit for mercy, and cringed as Mittel turned towards them, only for Senkit to place herself between the Eladrine and the pair. There were words exchanged, but Yort could not hear them. He turned, and he fled into the tunnels. He ran, swiftly and silently as the wind passed his people. Dozens of faces, strained with toil, accused him until he came at last to a quiet corner. There at last his magic failed him. Eort broke down and wept. There in the darkness he bowed his head and quietly cried. He wanted nothing more than to curl up in a ball and disappear. He raised his head towards the unseen heavens and cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken us? Thus he wept. My God, can you not see? All our people are cast down. They wander about the land, none with a bed to call his home. We are scattered about. Like the tree is broken before the storm, and her branches spread out across the land, so we have been broken and cast down. Your sons wander in exile. In lands made foreign we strive. We are cast down to the beasts. By the sword alone we remain, for the sword is all that remains to us. Brother fights against brother, and legion is turned against legion. All the glory of the kingdom has gone out. Your daughters are cast down into slavery. Into the hands of tyrants and oppressors they are delivered. Our young women are chattel fit for mines, and our beautiful daughters are taken away to be less than concubines. Those who fight, you have forsaken. Those who would stand you have let fall. Were you not our pillar and foundation in ages past? Where then has the strength of our arms gone? The brave are cast upon crosses, and by the walls of our jails they hang. Have we been unfaithful? That is not so. Every one of us goes about desperate to serve you. In your name, the priests command the brother to lay with his sister, and twelve women with a single man. In your name, legions rip each other into shreds. In your name, we have stood alone and weak, to be dealt with however our captors please. No more. No more shall this be, for while we have been faithful, where is your faithfulness, O conqueror? You were content to love us when we were strong, but now when we need you most, it pleases you to crush us. Behold, all that you had us do is now turned upon us. You made us into tyrants and oppressors over all the nations, we stood alone, you made us a stench unto every tribe and tongue. Behold, the nations gather together and are stronger for it, the dragon and the elf are called equal. The humans, with no god to call their own, surpass us. Where is the strength in solitary slavery? Where the wit in forsaking all allies, and becoming despised by vassals? For every sin against us, our fathers enacted in your name. If might alone determines what is right, then how are we different than your core demon? Long I had denied it, long I prayed that those who I strove against were heretics, blind to your will, but I can bear that I no longer. For this was the glory we were told of. This was the great empire we built it in your name and you let crumble into nothing. Therefore, I say, as for me and my house, we shall serve you no longer. Just as you have forsaken us, may you also be forsaken. Thus, the knight of treachery betrayed the god of tyranny. For he had stood beyond the lies of the evil one and would see his people bound no more. Neither to the chains of the Eladrine, nor the sweet whispers of the conqueror which had led them to this place. And he wept. He wept for his people, for his lost faith and innocence, and for his own folly. There, the hand was laid upon him. He turned, and he saw that a great crowd of his people had gathered and heard him, and many were weeping also. One man, who was advanced in age, came to him and said, Brother, you must be quiet, or you will draw their attention. We can all see that you are clearly not like us. What legion are you from? My legion is no more. Eort responded, wiping the last of the tears from his eyes. What of yours? Almost all of our people here are of the 20th Legion. We were led into a trap 20 years ago, and all taken captive. The old centurion answered him. No longer, Eort said, with new strength. No longer shall you be captive, and likewise you shall no longer be the 20th Legion. The old is passing away, and the Empire has been dead for 500 years. A new dawn is rising for our people, and with it a new and greater glory.
You shall be the first of this new dawn, and we shall reunite and free all our people. Henceforth, if you will dare to follow me, you are the first of the new legions. You are my Alpha Legion, and you shall never be slaves again. Well guys hope you enjoy today's video. We are going to assume you have if you have stayed to the end. Consider subscribing and clicking the notification bell if you really enjoyed it to stay up to speed with any and all new videos. Also check out the links below to our shop for some fat ass titties and our sponsor Rural and be sure to use a promo code at checkout so they know we sent you and you'll get 10% off. And until next time.